my question is for Robert. Uh, you produced Peter Gabriel's second album, which is my favorite of his, and I was just wondering if you had any anecdotes from... Yes, it. lots and lots <laughs> and lots. I think it's um, widely considered that my production on Peter's second album, which had the same title as his first and third, <laughs> uh, my production is a failure. I think that's a general consensus. Thank you for that <laughs> gasping and clasping of your breasts. <laughs> All right. Um, may I say I also consider the production on his first album sucked. <laughs> now, I will get... All right, here we are. <laughs> I will now tell you an actual story from the recording of the first Peter Gable solo album, which is where I met Tony Levin. Yeah. It was in Toronto, I believe, in October 1976. And there are very simple differentiation, two approaches to producing, there's more, but one is where the record producer undertakes to the record company that they will deliver an album by this artist even if the artist is not on it. <laughs> this is where the producer is the chief of police for the record company. The other approach is where the role of the producer is there to translate the artist and their music and who and what they are to translate that onto record. I would put myself in the second category and an example of that is the roaches where I was very concerned that men would not come in and tell these three women how they should be women on their first record. So, Peter Gabriel won. They're in the studio. Peter is behind a piano, and he has a suggestion to make on one of his songs. So, um, I have a suggestion. Producer, wrong! <laughs> that is a true story you will not hear from many. On to the second album, where Peter had not yet realised the only person who can produce Peter Gabriel is Peter Gabriel, which came after this. So my aim with Peter was to find a way of freeing his inner voice from Peter's overseeing what he did. In other words, there was, Peter had a close sense of what he wanted. There was a controlling element. I wished to shake Peter free from that. So his inner voice simply could get up and speak. And there is only one example of my work with Peter that succeeded. And it was not on Peter Gabriel too. It was Here Comes the Flood on Exposure. Mm. Here Comes the Flood on Exposure is Peter Gabriel's inner voice without Peter overseeing or directing what he thought Peter should be. I said, Peter, go and record it. And Peter went to another room in the, in the studio complex, sat down in one take, saying Here Comes the Flood. That was the authentic voice of Peter Gabriel. But I'm not sure we quite got that on Peter Gabriel too, which was somewhere in between the two. Peter Gabriel is one of the bona fide good guys in the industry, and it is my privilege and honor to have worked with him on three of his albums. I adore Here Comes the Flood on Exposure. You're right, it's... It's one of those moments when the heavens open and every time you listen to it, you are, it just arrives again. It's, it's timeless and wonderful. Yep. I can tell you a story you won't hear from anyone else, <laughs> if you'd like me to. Yes. It was on Peter Gabriel 3, which I played on as a guitarist. And I was in the studio when Kate Bush sung Je son from <laughs> <laughs> and 
she nailed it pretty well straight away. There, oh, electricity crackling. And I said to Steve Lillywhite, why are you getting Kate to keep singing this? She's nailed it. And in an autobiography of Steve Lillywhite, which I came across <laughs> fairly recently, Steve Lillywhite refers to this as a turning point in his life because Fripp had come in as a guitarist and had been demoted <laughs> from being the producer. <laughs> <laughs> and when asserting myself, that producer who'd been left behind, to say Kate had already nailed it, Steve Lillywhite, a turning point in his life, stepped forward and said, no, Kate, <laughs> sing it again. <laughs> and in this way, affirmed himself this was a turning point. Now, the second kind of producer, where you're there to translate and support and act in service of the artist, there is one paramount rule. Protect the artist. An example of not doing them is to get them sing time and time and time again what they've already done with magic. So that's the story. You won't hear from anyone else. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you.